Are we missing out by not recording our music at really high sample rates like 96 or 192 kilohertz? I see this question come up over and over again, and even gear manufacturers talk about on their interfaces like, oh, we can record at 384 kilohertz. Does it really matter? Are we really going to be able to make our music sound better at these higher sample rates? That's what we're gonna talk about today. Hey there, friend, it's Bobby Balo, the mixing and mastering engineer at Raytown Productions. This channel is dedicated to helping you make better sounding music without needing to spend money on really expensive gear or unnecessary plugins. If you're new here, thank you so much for joining me today. Be sure to hit that subscribe button because I drop new videos every single week and it's gonna help you level up the quality of your music so you don't wanna miss a single video. And as a thank you for your time today, I have a gift for you to help you on this crazy mixing and mastering journey we're all on. I've put together a comprehensive guide that has all of my favorite free mixing and mastering plugins. There's compressors, limiters, clippers, com I already said compressors, there's delays, there's reverbs, there's even a mastering grade sample rate converter, there's drum samples. This guide has literally everything you'd ever need. And these are all plugins and things that I use every single day when I mix and master music professionally. So I know they sound great and I think you're gonna get a ton of value out of it. So if that sounds interesting to you, check out the description. Again, there is a link to that free download. Okay, so let's start this video off on the right foot and talk about what sample rate actually is and what that means for our music. So all a sample rate is, is basically a number that tells us how many times that we sample a sound wave in one second. So for your standard audio recording, we would sample 44.1 kilohertz, which means 44,100 times every single second, we're making a note of where that waveform is digitally. Now there's a lot of misconceptions about how higher sample rates are going to give us a better quality or more professional sound to our recordings, but a lot of those are just complete misunderstandings of how sampling works. The major implication in terms of sample rate that we need to be aware of when we're working with audio is the fact that that basically defines the highest frequency we can record and reproduce. And that's basically it. Yeah, there's some other very nuanced differences with noise floor and all this. It's beyond the discussion of this video, and it certainly doesn't have a very big impact to our music. But in terms of the big picture, that's all you need to know. Now, there's a really simple equation out there called the Shannon-Nyquist theorem that states that if we take our sampling rate frequency and just divide it in half, that is the highest frequency that we'll be able to accurately reproduce. A 44.1 standard sampling rate and a 96K sampling rate are both going to accurately capture all the frequencies within human hearing, period. And you might think if we can add a few more dots on that waveform with higher sample rates, it has to be better for reconstructing the audio, right? That's intuitively what you might think, but that's not the case. And that's because of a lot of the work that was done to produce the Shannon Nyquist theorem, which states that we can reconstruct any band limited signal as long as we sample at greater than twice the highest frequency of that recorded audio. Now, the math to prove this is pretty intense, and it's definitely beyond the scope of this video. If you want to get even more nerdy about the definition, it just says that we only have one unique solution of how to fit all those little samples that we plotted over time as long as we're sampling at greater than twice the highest frequency of the audio we recorded. You cannot fit those data points with two different waveforms. There's only one solution. So basically, if we boil this down, there's really three main advantages that you're going to get by recording at higher sample rates. And two of them, I think, are pretty trivial and don't really help the quality of the sound much at all. The first is by having higher sample rates, we will be able to capture higher frequency audio information. Now, why we want to record ultrasonic sounds, I don't know, but we can do it. <laughs> The second benefit of higher sample rates is that we'll actually be able to increase our amplitude resolution, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, because it's not quite as cool as it sounds. And finally, the one thing that I think actually makes a very large difference and could be an advantage to working at these higher sample rates is what happens when we edit the audio at these higher sample rates, especially when we incorporate things like time stretching. 
And I'll give you a few examples and some situations where it's going to make the world of a difference. All right, so let's talk about that first benefit, the benefit of recording higher frequency information. So current audio standards allow us to accurately reproduce 22.05 kilohertz based on a 44.1 kilohertz sample rate. Okay, If we go up to 96K sample rate, now we can re accurately reproduce frequencies up to 48 kilohertz. That's crazy. That's almost two or three times what humans can hear. If you're doing audio for dogs or cats or bats or some other creature um, that hears way higher than humans, then maybe it makes sense to record at 96 kilohertz. But at 44.1 kilohertz, we already can perfectly recreate all the frequencies that we can hear. So is there some other reason why we might consider recording higher sample rates? Now let's talk about this because there's a lot more to this that meets the eye. Now something really interesting happens when we have sounds that were recorded at 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate that go beyond our ability to accurately reproduce them. So for example, we have 44.1 kilohertz sample rate. What happens if we record a 30 kilohertz sound? We no longer just have one solution that uniquely fits that waveform. And what this means is we're going to be inducing some sort of artifacts. And these artifacts are not harmonic with our music, and they sound pretty nasty. And it's something you probably have heard before. It's called aliasing. So much like how you might have multiple aliases online, like your Facebook account, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, the audio now has multiple aliases. And each of these aliases are mathematically indistinguishable from each other. So these artifacts that are generated from aliasing will actually be audible in our hearing range. So what does this sound like? It sounds very strange. I'll give you a quick example. So here's an example of what my voice might sound like when it's aliased. And I'm literally creating this effect by lowering the sampling rate of this audio. See, it doesn't sound very great, does it? So this aliasing will always happen if we do not filter out any of the frequencies that are higher than half our sampling rate. So we want to minimize this aliasing effect as much as possible. So how do we do that? So it turns out that early on in digital recording, like in the 90s and early 2000s, one of the best strategies to do this was simply to record at higher sample rates. So how do these really high frequencies get generated that end up getting folded back down into our hearing range? Well, the answer to that is that anytime we process digital audio, if we use anything that's nonlinear, basically we generate higher order harmonics of the sound that we're manipulating. So if you use a compressor or if you use a clipper or a limiter or some sort of saturation, all of these processes will generate higher order harmonics that will inevitably get folded back down into our hearing range if they're not filtered out within the plugin themselves. So when we use higher sampling rates, you're just extending the window at which you can generate harmonics and they'll basically never make their way back down into our hearing range because we've essentially just extended the window so far. Now, the downside to that is it's going to take a lot more computational power to process audio at 96 kilohertz sample rate. And I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I get music from bands or artists to mix, there are over 100 tracks. And so if I have 100 tracks of 96 kilohertz sample rate audio files, my computer starts smoking. So it makes the session unmanageable. So in some circumstances, I will downsample 96 kilohertz sample rates just to make the session usable. And that's just the nature of the beast. And that's something that we just have to live with. But fortunately for us, there's a lot of really smart plug-in manufacturers and the people that build these digital audio workstations for us to make music in that understand that aliasing is a problem. So they've designed tools like oversampling, which you may have heard of, that will actually take the audio file that we have, upsample it to really high sample rates like 96 or 192 kilohertz sample rate, and then do all the processing to it, and then filter out all of the extra harmonics that were generated so that there's no chance of it aliasing back down into our hearing range, and then it'll downsample it all within the plugin. So that gives us the benefit of having higher sample rates, but without needing to run our entire session at these higher sample rates. So this is why I think we really don't have a whole lot to worry about in terms of aliasing, 
because we basically have all of our bases covered by oversampling within the individual plugins themselves. There are so many other factors in the music creation process and mixing and mastering that are going to have way, way bigger impact to the overall sound than whatever residual aliasing artifacts we might have from all this stuff. Now, the second benefit to having a higher sample rate session is we'll actually improve our amplitude resolution. Now, this might sound way cooler than what it actually is. Right, because our waveform pretty much is perfectly reconstructed once we send it digitally back out to our speakers. But digitally within our software, if we have more samples on our waveform, our metering will have a better idea of where the maximum amplitude is for our waveform. So this is gonna help us in terms of metering because it'll help us more accurately see exactly where that peak amplitude signal is so that we don't prepare our final masters and accidentally export something that goes above zero. And if you've ever used a meter or a limiter that has a feature called true peak metering or true peak limiting, that's exactly what this thing does. It upsamples the audio and adds a lot more points to that waveform so it has a better indication of where the actual amplitude is. And the reason we need to upsample to improve our amplitude resolution is because sometimes the maximum peak of our waveform can exist in between two different samples. So you can imagine if we sample uh, audio every so many milliseconds and the waveform actually goes above two samples, our meter will only read what the value of the samples are and not where the actual waveform is. On the other hand, you might be lucky and where one of the samples are happens to be exactly where the highest point is on our waveform. So if we have more samples along the way, we're going to have a better chance of finding that maximum amplitude of our audio signal. And like I mentioned before, having more sample points doesn't really change the waveform and how we hear it. It just allows us to better, more accurately measure the amplitude within the digital environment so that our metering is more accurate. We can already reconstruct the audio signal based on the Shannon Nyquist criteria. So extra resolution is just a, a bonus in terms of metering for us. And if you were curious, anytime you have a waveform that goes above the two nearest samples, that's called an intersample peak. Inter meaning in between those two samples. The peak exists between them. So you probably have heard of that before. And to be totally honest, that whole intersample peak thing is an entirely another discussion. I personally find it extremely difficult to even hear them. And in fact, most commercial music that you listen to every single day has enormous intersample peaks and no one's complaining about them. So I don't see that changing anytime soon. So those last two benefits to higher sample rates, I really don't think are gonna make a difference in terms of your overall audio quality, but this third benefit I think can dramatically improve your quality. So higher sample rates will allow us to have better and cleaner time stretching capability. So why would anybody wanna time stretch their audio? Those that use it either creatively or to do editing to our audio to make it a polished production. I typically work in a lot of pop, hip hop, metal, rock genres, and all those genres tend to need very, very tight productions for them to sound really professional. And while you can get away with just cutting up the audio and sliding it around and doing some crossfades, that doesn't work all the time. I will have to do quite a bit of time stretching to make everything as clean and as perfect as possible. And if we have more samples there, it feeds the algorithm with more data. And a lot of these time stretching algorithms are gonna benefit from these higher sample rates. And this goes deep into the mathematics behind how time stretching algorithms work with how they stretch and interpolate between points. So if we have more data there, it is definitely beneficial. To be totally honest, I was very skeptical that we would even see a benefit. So I did some time stretching to double the length of a guitar playing, and I did it at 44 kilohertz sample rate in 96, and then I did a blind shootout where I did not know what sample file I was listening to, and seven out of seven times I was able to pick out which file was time stretched at 44.1 kilohertz sample rate because it sounded like crap. 
every single time I got it right. So that tells me that I can definitely hear a difference when you time stretch higher sample rate and lower sample rate audio files. And if you do a thousand edits like I do sometimes on some of these really technical metal songs, all those edits are going to add up and diminish the quality of our final product. So in the circumstance where you're going to go into a project knowing you're probably going to do a lot of editing, I would highly recommend you record at as high of a sample rate as you possibly can, do all the edits, get everything perfect, then downsample for your mixing because your mixing's not really going to benefit that much at these higher sample rates. Because again, most of our plugins have this oversampling feature which does all that for us automatically. Now I tried a few different algorithms just to make sure that it wasn't just one crappy algorithm in Cubase and it turns out that every single algorithm that I tried, I could hear a benefit when I was at a higher sample rate. Now what's interesting also is that you can take a 44.1 kilohertz sample rate audio file and then just up sample it to 96 kilohertz and you still get the same benefit as if you were to record it at that higher sample rate. I tested this with a blind shootout where I had a 96 kilohertz sample rate audio file and then I upsampled a 44 kilohertz sample rate file. And during the blind shootout, I chose one of the files almost 50% of the time and same with the other one. So there really wasn't any significant statistical difference, which is great news for anybody that's already recorded 44.1 kilohertz audio because you can just upsample to 96 or 192 kilohertz, do all of your editing and your time stretching at that sample rate, and then downsample it back to 44 or 40 kilohertz sample rate to then do all of your mixing. That way you get the best of both worlds and your session won't be bogged down. Okay, so I just wanted to bring you into a session to show you what the different time stretching algorithms actually sound like. Um, now, some of them are more subtle than others, but there's some that make a huge difference when it comes to the quality of the time stretching. So here is the original vocal that I time stretched. I wish it was blind, so I couldn't see time. It comes for us all. Okay, now. I've done several different time stretching algorithms. So this first one is elastic pitch. Uh, the orange is elastic pro time, which is I think that basically the standard time stretching algorithm in Cubase. Then we have MPEX musical. Then we have this standard uh, time stretching algorithm, which is actually based on like a granular synthesis method. And, and you'll see what I mean by that in a second. And then we have this elastic tape uh, algorithm. So let me just show you now, especially with this video being uploaded to YouTube, it's probably going to be very challenging to hear a difference. I'll bounce back and forth. And like I mentioned in the blind shootout, I didn't make a single mistake on any of these uh, when it came to figuring out which one was time stretched at 44 kilohertz because I could hear a difference. And it was not a good difference. It was a, it was a bad difference. The first one I'll play every time is going to be time stretched at 44. And then the second one will be the one time stretched at 96 kilohertz. I wish it was blind so I couldn't see time It comes for us all I wish it was blind so I couldn't see time It comes for us Okay, let's go to the Elastic Pro Time I wish it was blind so I couldn't see time it comes for us all. I wish it was blind so I couldn't see time. I think on long notes like time is where you can really hear the difference between the 44 and then the 96 kilohertz time stretch files. Uh, let's go to MPEX Musical. I wish it was blind so I couldn't see time. It comes for us all. I wish it was blind so I couldn't see time. It comes for us all. Now, this algorithm is based on what I would call like a granular synthesis. It's actually the same type of strategy for um, synthesizers, where you take a small piece of the audio file and then you figure out how to patch it together 
over and over and over again so that you can stretch out the length of the sound, but you're using an initial piece of the, the file. So check out what it sounds like at 44 kilohertz, and then we'll go to 96, and I even did 192 because it just kept getting better. So you hear how there's like a stutter almost the whole time? And that's because of the particular grain size, so the number of samples that this is using to figure out uh, how to string together the vocal performance. Let me go to, I'll play this and then I'll go to 96. I want you was blind so I couldn't see time. It comes for us all. Now let me go all the way up to 192 because it gets even better. I want you was blind so I couldn't see time. It comes for us all. Like, that is crazy. That's like night and day difference, right? And then finally, this is a tape style algorithm. So, this actually changes the pitch down, but I'll just play it just for completeness. And just has a little bit of a smoother characteristic to it. I know it's kind of distracting because it's pitched so low, but hey, if you use this kind of vocal effect in your music, it might sound a little bit better, a little bit smoother if you go up to that 96 kilohertz. All right, that was a lot of stuff. So let's quickly recap what we talked about today. While higher sample rates may help reduce some aliasing artifacts, the reality is, is that with the way plugins are being designed now, with the oversampling features that they almost all have, we can achieve a comparable, if not better, reduction of aliasing just using the oversampling than running our entire sessions at higher sample rates and eating up a lot of CPU in the process of that. So by literally just doing a 2x oversampling on a session that's at 48 kilohertz, it's like basically having the audio at 96 kilohertz sample rate, which is enormous. And if you have the ability to oversample at like 16x, that's higher than any capability we have right now in terms of sample rate for our sessions as it is. So just having a 2x oversampling on our plugins is going to make our audio quality so, so good in terms of aliasing reduction. Out of my personal experience, I really don't think you're really going to gain much by recording these higher sample rates in terms of aliasing reduction. I also mentioned that with these higher sample rates, we're going to have improved amplitude resolution. Now, while that doesn't really help us in terms of audio quality, it's going to improve our ability to meter the audio and determine the actual amplitude of our waveform. Or, in other words, we're going to better resolve the intersample peaks at these higher sample rates. But again, we can use a technique like oversampling within a metering plugin to do exactly that anyways. So there probably isn't a whole lot of benefit there either. And finally, an actual measurable improvement to the audio quality that I found is when we are doing editing or time stretching to our audio at higher sample rates. Now, there are many different algorithms that will time stretch audio, but all the ones that I tested within Cubase when I did this, I was able to pick out in a blind shootout every single time, 100% accuracy, when I time stretched the audio at 96 kilohertz and 44 kilohertz sample rates. And the 96 kilohertz sample rates always sounded better. There was less weird like flanging artifacts and weird stuff going on. I was able to pick it out every single time without ever making a mistake. So that's enough evidence to me to suggest that anytime I'm gonna be doing a lot of editing, I'm probably gonna record at these higher sample rates. Now is recording at 96 kilohertz versus 44 gonna be what separates a pro sounding song from an amateur one? Not at all. There's so many more important factors along the song creation, recording, mixing, mastering process than sample rate. If you take the time to make sure that all your instruments are perfectly in tune and you put new strings on your guitar and put new drum heads on all of your drums and you capture it with microphones that you tested that you think sound the best, that is gonna make such a bigger improvement than just recording at a higher sample rate.
Again, the only time I really think you're going to be able to hear a noticeable difference in the audio quality is if you're doing some sort of time stretching. So if you take my advice and start recording audio at higher sample rates because you're going to be doing a lot of editing, and then you need to downsample all those consolidated files so you can mix them at a more reasonable sample rate, uh, I would highly recommend checking out the free sample rate converter that I have in my favorite free mixing and mastering plugins guide. And a link to that is in the description. I can promise you that sample rate converter is pretty amazing. It also has a batch sample rate conversion feature. So literally you can just render all your files down at like 192 kilohertz sample rate and then just batch convert everything. And again, it's totally free and it's in my free downloadable PDF. So go and grab that. And while you're at it, let me know what you thought of this video. Was there any of these benefits that you thought were surprising? And then if you record at higher sample rates, let me know why in the comments. Do you think it improves the quality of your recording? Have you done a lot of blind shootout testings to prove it to yourself? Let me know. I love having these conversations with all of you, and I think it's really good learning experience for anybody that's trying to understand more about sample rate conversion and trying to get the best sound out of their home studio. So if you found this video helpful today, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to support me or this channel, the easiest thing you can do is just share this video or one of my other videos with your friends. Share it on a social media platform like Facebook or Reddit, and that'll help get the word out. It'll give people some good information to dive into when they're learning how to make better sounding audio out of their home studio. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and attention today, and I hope to see you in another video.